How are we doing? Good to have a break? Yeah. Have a feed? Is it good food? Yeah. Somebody made us a lovely platter. And all I ate was an apple. It's <laughs> pretty normal though for me. Yeah. Okay. Where do we want to start? Who wants to start? Patricia, you want to start? Yeah, let's start. Oh, sorry. Yes. Sorry, one before you, Patricia. Fire away. Hi. Um, my question is about parenting. Mm -hmm. um, my ideals are very in line with what you talk about as a parent. Yep. And mm -hmm. I find myself being the other type of parent. What do you mean by the other type? The, the judgmental, the, the... Um, bribery, punishment. Okay. So your ideals are one thing, yep. and then you find My yourself slipping into the other. My actions quite often are the other, and I'm yep. really at odds with that. Yeah. Um, Can I make a suggestion? This yes. is a suggestion actually for most parents. Um, we have, like you said, we have basically two ways uh, of parenting generally, and particularly we set up our ideals of parenting usually a lot of times before we even have children, right? Yes. Definitely. And, yep. and, and this is why a lot of people have the statement, you know, have you ever had children? No. You'll find out when you have them <laughs> as to what it's like. So we have our whole heap of ideals. And then we have what happens in practice. How do you spell practice like that? Do from yep. Yep. Um, so we have the ideal of what we want to do as parents and then we have in practice what we do. Now... What I'd put to you is your ideals are connected with the God part of your pure soul intention. So remember I drew up the three selves before. Yep, yep. So if we look at the three selves, so there's this, the first self was the self that God created. And if I could just go down a bit in volume because I'm starting to ring a bit. So, so the first self is uh, the, God, the self that God created. And the self that God created was... Remember our true self. Now, our true self has many ideals. These are usually where our ideals come from, in fact. Um, the only problem with ideals is we very rarely put them into practice mm -hmm. because of a lot of the other constructions of the other selves. So then we've got the two other selves that we mentioned. We've got the self that our parents created which is the injured self. And then we've got the self that we constructed. So, so we can just write, we ourselves constructed, which is the facade. Now, in practice, what happens is it's mostly the facade and the injured self that dominate our treatment of our children. Right? So this is what actually affects what happens in practice more than the ideals that we have which come from our true self. Now obviously we'd like to shift that. You know, we'd obviously like to get our idyllic situation with our children into practice. We'd like to merge the two to, so that the ideals are what actually we do practice with our children. The problem is, is that to do that intellectually is very, very difficult. And in fact, I feel it's almost totally impossible to actually treat your children in an idyllic way without having sort of fixed up or, or repaired the injuries of the self. Does that make sense? Yes, yep. And as a result of that, we finish up practising everything that we don't preach, basically. We finish up practising a, lo a lot of things that we are, ourselves are actually ashamed of, even with regard to our own children. Now, what we need to do instead of that is start learning where our treatment of our children actually comes from. What, what, why do we finish up treating our children in a way that we ourselves are even ashamed of doing at times? And where that comes from is always from these injuries... That, we, that either we have created through our life or that our parents created by injuring us in, in our belief systems and the way in which tr we treat others and not actually releasing those injuries, in other words, feeling them fully and actually letting them go, 
So by, by releasing them, we would actually then give up these selves and become more this person. And this person is the person with the ideals, which would then be able to be put into practice quite readily. So the answer to treating your children in this manner is actually to release the emotions that cause you to hold on to these two selves. So in the end, the answer is the same answer as actually in learning how to embrace your own life and learning how to embrace yourself and learning how to live in desire and passion. That also will result in you now automatically treating your children in a better manner as well. Automatically. Yeah. So what, what the world will tell you, though, is that they tell you that there is things that you can practice, that you can try or attempt to practice, to put into practice, without there being a real emotion involved in the practice. And what I put to you is that unless the heart actually changes, then it's going to be very, very difficult for you to put into practice something's loving when in your heart you have very, very different emotions in play. Now, rather than judging yourself, which is one of the first things we generally do as a parent, right? We, we generally have the newborn babe in our arms and we've got no idea how to look after it. Let's face it, nobody's spent any time generally showing us what to do with the baby and unless we've had some interest in it, and for most males in particular, there's generally not been much interest in it, um, but also for many women, there's not been much interest in, in looking after somebody else's baby to learn <laughs> how to do it. And so what we do is we have this new baby in arms and we've got no idea how to act towards it. We've got no idea how to even change its own, how, how, to, how to look after its basic <coughs> needs sometimes even. Nobody's educated us. So, so firstly, we need to go through a process of education and usually that's using the school of hard knocks, as the saying goes initially so we go through that and so what we have is that we, we start doing all of these things the baby needs and the baby's often crying and distressed and uh, we've got no idea why we change its nappy we feed it but it's still crying and still distressed in many cases and we go well, what's going on what's going on we don't understand and part of what we need to come to do, I feel, as people on understand a basic truth, and that is this. That my emotions as the parent, so this is the parent. That I deny... are the source of all distress and pain in the child. So this is a basic truth that I need to come to understand. <laughs> that every time I deny one of my injured self-emotions and I shut it down, I don't want to feel it, usually because I'm afraid of it. But often because I'm angry about having it in the first place. Or, and I, we have a lot of different other emotions. Sometimes there's shame as well and guilt about having it. There's all these kind of emotions. But every time I deny one of those emotions, the child is the most sensitive person in my environment to those emotions. So the child will begin to reflect my <coughs> unhealed emotion that I need to experience. So for example, if I have changed the child's nappy and I've, I've fed the child and everything else and the child is still crying uncontrollably, there's a very high likelihood that I am still needing to cry uncontrollably. And I'm not doing it. In other words, I'm denying a heap of grief that I actually have and that grief inside of me is now being, because I'm denying it, is now being reflected out of me and the child, being the most sensitive person in my environment to me, is going to feel that grief to the, to the greatest extent. So let's say I'm a, I'm a woman and my child is a girl child. And as a woman, I have huge amounts of anger in me about being a woman, about what that entails, you know, looking after the family, cleaning up after them, all those kind of things. By the way, 
that is not how God created you to be a woman. That is just what the world created you to do. But we often have a lot of anger and, and upset about that inside of us that we deny. So, so what finishes up happening is that that denied emotional rage now is projected out of me of being really upset about being a woman. Now, if I have a girl child, this girl child is going to have a feeling inside of her transmitted from you that she does not understand and that is she needs to be upset about being a woman. Does that make sense? She will not understand it she will not, because she, she doesn't have the intellectual development to understand the emotion. She doesn't have any thought process involved at this point. All she can do is feel the emotion. So she does. She will feel the emotion that you're shutting down and denying. Now, if I had a boy child and my, my mother's emotion was a, like, a lot of rage towards the boy, towards men, because, you know, men, you've got to look after them all the time, let's face it. They, they can't even cook or clean for themselves, a lot of them. And, you know, we have all of these different emotions, this is what we feel. And a lot of those emotions percolate up in us, but we suppress them because we want to be nice people. So we suppress all of those emotions. Every denied emotion in the parent will now go straight to the most... Well, it goes to everyone in the environment, of course. But the child is the most sensitive person in that environment to feel that emotion. And so if it was a male child, he'll be just crying or screaming uncontrollably and I've got no idea why. Not realising that it's actually my own denied or suppressed emotion towards males that caused my child to feel like there's no love coming towards them. Does that make sense? Yes. So if we can understand the relationship between every denied emotion, every t the cost as a parent of denying our emotion is our child will automatically experience that denied emotion to the greatest extent. That's the cost of our, us as a parent denying our own emotion. And by the way, this applies whether our, parents are grown, uh, our children are grown up or not. So actually I could be a grown up man of 40 and my mum's 65 still denying the same emotion. I'll still be feeling it from her. Right? And I'll still feel it from her when she passes into the spirit world until she releases it. And then all of a sudden I go, oh, I feel different as a male now. You know, different. And often you'll go through some crying of your own in that place. And you might be 60 years of age having a cry about somebody accepting you as a male, not realising that the trigger for it was your mum just dealt with it in the spirit world. Right? So, so the beauty of... Uh, and this, when we understand this truth, it's sort of a beautiful truth in a way too. In the sense that it helps us to understand the dynamic between what's happening between the child and the parent. So, so most of the child's distress is actually caused by the denied emotion in the parent. The irony is, when the parent feels the emotion, the child will usually instantly stop feeling it if the parent feels it. Now, we've been with couples who have families and we've stayed with them many times. And often times in the staying with them, what we do is we sit with them. And all we do is we sit with them for a half a day and we just tell them every single emotion they're denying at every single moment and the effect that it's having on each child. So recently we stayed with a couple up in Armadale. They've got three children under the age of four. All right. Now, the middle child is a boy, the two youngest children are boys and the oldest one is a girl. And the middle child, the boy, is very open also to spirit influence. He can actually see them and he'll often point to them and he'll talk about it with mum and dad, what he can see and all those kind of things as well, right? So you've got a very spirit influenced child. Dad is also a person who see, who, who's talked to spirits all of his life. He tried to shut it down when he was six years of age, but he's talked to spirits all of his life. So that's the dynamic. The two of them are working their way through emotions together. And it's beautiful just sitting down and being able to describe every single little interaction that was happening. So it was, some, it was amazing sometimes. When the parents, both of the parents, were feeling their own emotions, it was like peace descended on the children. And they would just be present, playing together quietly, not fighting with each other, nothing. Right? And it was just like so peaceful. It sort of, you, you sort of felt it like, oh, 
you know that feeling of relief <laughs> that you get when everything's nice and quiet and peaceful after everything hasn't been? <laughs> and you just feel that peace descend upon it. Now, I would start talking to one of the parents about an emotion that they have. For instance, I started talking to Dad, his name's Peter, I started talking to him about an emotion he had of fear of spirits. The instant I started talking to him, the second boy went into terror. Because Peter started denying his fear of spirits in the discussion. He, he said to me, his words were, yes, I know I'm afraid of spirits. That was his words. The feeling was, don't tell me anything about my fear of spirits. That was the feeling. All right? Very different to the words. And so he was trying to keep down his fear of spirits, trying to suppress it. He has a lot of fear of spirits because when he was young, different things happened to him from spirits that he, he that he's afraid to... Uh, he, he remembers them, but he doesn't want to remember them, basically. He tries to push them out of his mind. And as a result of that, the fear sort of starts coming up in him and he pushes that back down. And as soon as he pushes that down, the firstly, the most mediumistic child just started really acting up and then eventually all three children were just like they were running around the house like <laughs> looking for anything to destroy and they did in, in, in the space of 10 minutes like they destroyed half the house while we we're just standing there and then as as we describe him now now Peter feel the emotion feel the emotion of fear that you actually have and he starts feeling it uh, I'm allowed to feel it I'm, you know and he starts to, he started connecting to it he started tearing up and peace descended on the child, on the, on the family. It's just They didn't do anything. They didn't hold the children. They didn't try to stop them or anything else. It just all descend, peace descended again. And then when we started talking to mum about some of her emotions with men, all of a sudden her daughter hit her second son. And then, you know, we had to go through that entire process of what happened. And her daughter actually said, mummy, they told me to do it. They meaning some spirits who were with them that she could see. Right? And then as we discuss all of that, then it all clears up. And then we start talking about with the mum about her emotion of having to please men. And all of a sudden, the two boys came up to her screaming and pulling on her and pulling her face and pulling her clothes. And like you could hardly get a word in edgeways because of all the noise happening. And all I said to all we said to mum was just. Feel your emotion of how bad this feels of being attacked by these two boys who want something from you and you don't even know what it is. And when she went into that, she started crying. The instant she started crying, the two boys just walked away and started playing by themselves. Now, I have seen all of those things happen hundreds and hundreds of times. Right? Enough to know in this life, let alone my entire life. And enough to know that how much of a denied emotion affects the child. The key for a parent is to, to experiment with it. You see, what happens as parents is that we are so... Like, the concept that we are personally responsible for our child's pain is such a terrible concept that most parents can't even admit to themselves that it's true. Right? Because to admit it means that they're a bad mother or a bad father and they don't even admit it, let alone face the emotional reason why it happens. My feelings are if you experiment with it as a parent, if you experiment with every time you see bedlam in your household, every time something ramps up, every time something happens between the children, if you reflect upon yourself and your own emotions and what you were denying in that moment, because you're always denying something in that moment, when you feel about what you're denying in that moment, the children will instantly be relieved of the distress they feel. And it's absolutely remarkable how like, instant it is. It is literally the very instant that you choose to feel it. And we've, like I said, we've had many th you know, thousands of experiences now with children and parents with them, demonstrating to them that this is the truth of how children interact with parents. So by the time... Now, obviously, as the child grows, the child becomes more and more self-aware and less and less influenced 
by the parents' emotions. Although, of course, because it's already had this background of huge influence from the parent, of course it's still carrying a lot of the emotional injuries. Does that make sense? So, so e this is why even when a child is 20, a lot of times their actions is a complete result of something the parent's still denying within themselves. But now the child is old enough to think for itself, to make decisions for itself and so forth. Now it's taking that injury that it's had and going out into the world with it. And as a parent, the only way you can change that, again, is to look at your denied emotions about what they're doing and allow yourself to have those emotions triggered. The, the issue we face is that we don't have to think very much into the future to actually heal anything with our children. Every moment there is an attraction event, there is a, our soul is putting out the signals to pull into it the, the events that will heal the soul. So if you allow yourself to feel in the moment, you will always in the end heal something. You'll heal something emotionally if you allow yourself to feel in the moment. The issue we have as parents is we're often in a state of denial. So what we, when we've talked to parents, often they are so interested in putting out the fire that the children, is create, the children's, uh, the children are creating together that, that they don't understand that the fire the children is creating, are creating is because of their own emotions infecting the child to create those particular fires. So, so what they do is they run around chasing down the effects of the emotion that they're denying in themselves. Which, when you think about it, is probably appropriate. Can you see why it's appropriate? The parents denying something in, the, in, this, in itself. That something is going out to everyone in the universe, but particularly to its child. The child is acting out the emotion the parent's denying. Right? Isn't that appropriate? Of course it's appropriate. The child being the person who's most sensitive, is telling you, and if you don't love your child enough to change your own <laughs> emotional state, then you're obviously yet to love. Because if you can't love the persons you're damaging the most, then, then at the end of the day, we're not yet loving. So when we deny emotions as a parent, we need to understand that while those emotions go out to everyone, those emotions hit our children the most. And our children often, for the rest of their lives, feel the effect of some of those emotions. You think about it for yourself. Many of you have emotional injuries that you've carried into further future relationships that you know for certain came from how one or both parents treated you at some point. Right? And it's a known fact in psychology, right? That's why many psychologists work through childhood injuries with with, parent, with adults because they know the relationship between the child and the parent and how the parent's projected emotion and the actions that have taken out towards the child have affected the child for the rest of its life. So now that we know that, the key then is to stop denying the parent emotions. Now, you can, let's say one of your denied emotions is actually rage towards your own child. That is not the kind of emotion I'm talking about because that is what is a facade emotion. That's an emotion you created to avoid the injured emotion, the injured self emotion. So the facade emotion is just the emotion you'd like to play out to damage somebody else so you don't have to look at your own emotion. The key is to go, okay, my children are going mad. What am I feeling? For most mothers, they're feeling overwhelmed. In that moment, the main primary feeling is I'm overwhelmed. But many of us are taught that to be overwhelmed is a bad thing. That to be overwhelmed is actually very vulnerable and people will, you know, will attack you for being overwhelmed and so forth. And a lot of times I've just encouraged the mother to sit down in the middle of the floor and just have a big cry. And ironically, in that moment, the children all of a sudden calm down. Right? Because they're reflecting or triggering her overwhelmed emotion that she is denying. So because mothers in particular still in Australia have a lot more to do with the children generally with regard to upbringing than fathers do, mostly because many fathers still go off to work while the mothers stay home and care for the child, obviously the mother's emotions in particular are going to affect the child quite a lot. Whereas if, uh, if, the, if it's more of an equal uh, caring for the children, where both father and mother 
care for the children, then obviously it's both mother and father's emotions affecting the children quite a lot. If the child spends a lot of its time in childcare, then it's going to have a third influence upon the child, and that is the emotions of the people who are caring for the children in childcare and how that affects the child and how it responds emotionally. But if we all understand that it's our denied emotions that the children are affecting the most, then we can cure things very, very rapidly in ourselves, but also peaceful peace descends on the family as well. Do you, do you have a technique that um, you can use when you're in the shopping centre or ah. where you can defer <laughs> it till you are at home? Well, what do most mothers feel when they go shopping with two children? <laughs> they stress before they walk out the door. Let's face it. I, like I've. I've done that myself, shopped with two children by myself uh, who were under, under two years of age and, uh, yeah, it was pretty hard, right? And so what happens is you, your own emotions really ramp up even before you walk out the door. You're worried, you know, you try to get everything ready before you go, don't you? You, you say, all bums wiped and all, all fed happen, all watered, all bums wiped all dressed, all whatever, and you get everything together and you get all the gear together and all the prams and all the, you know, all the paraphernalia that goes with it and you get it all together. And of course, by this time, you're already generally quite overwhelmed with the, with the prospect. And if they're not asleep, well, which we view as a blessing, <laughs> um, then we're, we're very worried about what's going to happen next, don't we, generally? And, and so, for sure enough, our own fear is already in a heightened state. Most of the time we're trying to deny it, of course, because that's what we do with our fear. It's what we were taught to do from our own childhood. And so we suppress our fear about what's going to happen. Of course, that then increases the chances of something quite negative happen. And then, of course, as we go along and then eventually halfway through shopping, wake up happens and all those kind of things. And after that, it can get quite bedlam. I remember one couple just recently told us that that she just sat down in the middle of the shopping centre crying why her three children <laughs> um, were actually attacking the shopping centre, right? <laughs> and she just was overwhelmed by the whole thing and she just had to let herself have a big cry about it. But, but the problem is that, is that we get ourselves in this heightened state of fear already worried about what's going to happen. And that already now increases the amount of emotion going at the child. And fear, by the way, this denied fear, not, not the feeling of fear, but the denied fear, also now stops a protective barrier from being around the child with regard to spirit influence. So the more afraid I become, the easier it is for spirits to now influence my children as well. And there's lots of spirits in the spirit world that just want to have fun with some kids because they've missed out on having it when they were themselves children. And so what they do is they overcloak the children and, do, and run amok. Yeah, and quite often you see two or three spirits around every child, when if you can see them, you see two or three spirits around every child just causing them to run amok, you know, like in this, in this dazed um, state of heightened activity, shall I call it. That's being polite. And, and it's our fear that gets us into that place. So quite often our fear ramps up. We've got spirit influence now coming over our children. And then on top of that, we go into the shopping centre. We've now got the projected emotions of every single person in the shopping centre. Right? Much of which is now being received by the child. So now their distress heightens. And without the protective barrier of our protection, because our fear does, uh, is what like, destroys our protective barrier around the child. Because remember, when we're in a state of love, we're not in a state of fear, so therefore the children are more protected, they then get pressured by all these external emotions from the environment and they will actually act out what every single person around them doesn't want to do. In other words, what every single person around them denies in themselves in terms of an emotion. And so this is why you get children in, a, in an environment where there's 50 people projecting emotions at them. The children ramp up their activity. You know, they don't... They're not listening to the feelings of anger and rage coming at them. They're, they're feeling all that rage and going into rebellion. You know, like, and so you get all of that happening as well. So the key thing is to understand the dynamics of what's going on. Now, in the middle of the shopping centre, often that's very hard to do. 
And you've got to be pretty connected to yourself emotionally before you can do that. One of the best recommendations I can make to mothers when they go shopping is this. Don't go out of your body. See, what happens with most mothers is things get so intense around them that eventually they actually themselves leave or try to step away from their own sense of staying connected with their own body. Now, the problem with doing that is you now leave everything open to external influences now. Do you, do you follow? Yeah, and you forget <coughs> half your shopping list. You will forget half your shopping list for sure because you're already out of body and you don't even want to look at the shopping list, let's face it. But on top of that, you are now exposing the child to external influence from the other people but also from spirits who will affect their behaviour. Yep. If you stay in your body no matter what, you have a much greater chance of actually maintaining a connection with yourself, whether you need to cry or not, do that, that's fine. See, see, sooner or later, um, we're going to get used to seeing mothers crying in a shopping centre. Nowadays what happens when a mother cries in the shopping centre, and let's face it, many of you have been mums, right? How distressed were you at times in the shopping centre? You could have cried many times, but for many of you, you could have cried, right? But we shut it all down, shut it all down, shut it all down, keep it all under wraps, right? It's too embarrassing to do that. And so what we do is we teach the next generation of mothers they are not allowed to cry either, which actually denies their emotions, which actually causes more pain and distress in the child and therefore heightens their activity and so forth. And, and what we need to do is just allow people to, to, to do what they need to do with their tears. We all get so distressed about somebody crying. Like yesterday, when certain people went into crying, neighbours were going like that on their arm. Why, why are we doing that for? You don't need to do that. You need to let the person cry. They're connecting to an emotion they're having for, they've had, not had for years. Let them have it now, you know. Every time we do that, we're actually exercising our, our will to try to attempt the person to calm down. Like crying is a good thing for the soul, not a bad thing. So we need to let them do it. Like allow them to do it. Encourage them to finish the process of crying in the sense of completely rather than halfway through we're trying to stop them, shut them down. Every time we do that, we are trying to stop something in ourselves, actually. Right? And when we do this with our children, a lot of times when you see the pain and distress of the child, we don't allow ourselves to connect emotionally to their pain and distress. And because of that, we're going away from our body in that moment. Now they're in more pain and distress because they feel less love. Every time you as a parent step away from yourself when you're parenting your children, your children feel less love from you. What they feel is, you don't want me. That's what they feel. Because they can't feel you anymore. You're, you're gone away. Right? You're trying to get away from how you feel and you're going away and they can't feel you either. And they feel more distressed, not less. Right? If we stay connected... It's a very, very different experience. And you can have beautiful, joyful experiences going shopping, actually. Yeah. But only if we, as parents, deal with our denied emotions in the situation. Now, the challenge in today's society, and I feel in the future societies we have, there won't be this challenge. But in today's society, the challenge is when you're one of a few people who are dealing with their emotions in an open manner like this, everyone else will either wants to shut you down wants to criticise you or tell you that there's something wrong with you or pump you full of medication. Right? That's what they want to do. This is, you know, how do, we, how do we help a person who's crying too much? Put them on antidepressants. That's what we do. To stop them being crying, we think. You know, like, but oftentimes they need to have a cry to release the emotion associated with it. So, so this is the issue we face as parents. Our denied emotions affecting the distress of the child and as a result of these denied emotions in the parent, we are acting out of the injured self so what we practice will actually be very different to the ideal. As soon as we accept, start accepting these emotions, we are now feeling the emotions of the injured self 
therefore not projecting them at our children, so our practice will change and eventually become the ideal. It's not going to happen overnight because we've got hundreds of emotions that, and belief systems that cause us to, to do what we do. But, but every one of them that comes out of us will be another one that we won't use anymore. So once I get rid of the emotion of attempting to bribe my children with lollies, once I've gotten rid of that, my children will be able to walk past the lolly aisle without screaming. Right? That's what they'll be able to do. And as I deal with more emotions and more emotions, my guilt is apparent that I don't know what I'm doing, because most of us, let's face it, as parents have felt that feeling at some point. The guilt is apparent that I don't know what I'm doing, I release that. But all of a sudden it feels like I know what I'm doing more <laughs> than what did before. You know? And then as I release some of the feelings and judgments that I have about tears, all of a sudden I'm allowed to cry and now I'm not denying my tears. So I'm walking along the road going to the shopping centre with the pram, a couple of kids in there, the kids are playing away happy, I'm crying. As soon as I stop crying, they start crying. As soon as I start crying, they stop crying. As soon as they start crying and they start, you know, it's the same thing over and over. And it, when, if we experiment with it, you don't have to believe what I'm saying. If you're a parent, experiment with it and see whether I'm right or not. And I guarantee you, you'll find out that it's right. Yep. So, so allow yourself to heal the injured self. Try to forget about ever acting in the facade self anymore. You want to feel the injured self. Your practice will then become your ideal. And you'll actually feel quite proud of yourself as a parent then. At the moment, there's a lot of emotions on the planet where parents are not very proud of themselves, but they don't know what else to do. And that's because there's a fundamental thing they don't understand, and that is that their denied emotions are what's causing most of the pain. Uh, can we have the microphone? Oh, yep. I'm just wondering, going to that, what about the opposite? In, in other words, your injured self would have been you're not allowed or you know it's silly to express emotion if it's even joyous and wonderful because sometimes you know i have laughed in public and people think i'm insane yep yep yeah okay because people make those sort of judgment so i'm saying about what about the opposite well the truth is that you laughing is your true self right but your injured self looks at the judgment of you laughing. So your, your injured self has judgment about the laughter of others or the laughter of yourself, right? And that judgment will be reflected at you from others if you have that injury. So if I laugh and I don't receive judgment from others, then I know that I don't have that injury. But if I laugh and other people judge me for it, then I know that I have the injury that I will respond to other people's judgment about laughter. And that would have come from my parents at some point. There's no, you know, we might have even been punished for laughing. You know, some situations when we're a child are actually quite hilarious, but our parents don't think they are. <laughs> you know, like, you know, you see Dad slip on his backside down the, you know, down the hill when it was wet because of the ice, and you have a big laugh, and then Dad didn't think it was very happy, and he comes back and gives you a wet welt for it. Then, of course, you're going to be very worried about laughing at some point, and you'll worry about the judgment of others. So every situation does have its own attractions based on the soul injuries. Yep. The key is to, again, stay in the situation. Don't run away from it. Stay in the situation. Feel the emotions associated with the situation. And if you fully feel the injured self in that moment, you will actually never create those situations again. Or if they are created by your environment, you won't actually ever feel bad about the situation again. So... So the simplest thing for you to do when you're uh, following the path of love is to actually live in the moment, but live in the moment not from an intellectual perspective, from an emotional perspective. So I want to feel what I feel from you right now. Does that make sense? And I'm responding to that feeling right now. And if I have an emotional injury about that feeling, it comes out of me right now. That's what I want to eventually learn how to do. And if I do that... I will actually progress very rapidly, not only towards God, but also in my own happiness. You'll feel your authentic self pretty much all the time. Yeah. Yep. Is there any other questions on that subject? No? Different subject? Is there any other questions on that subject, on the parenting subject? Because I'd probably like to address them.
if you have any more. Yeah. If we go um, up to Fab, because you do have two kids that I know, and then down here. Um, what if the child is actually grieving in front of you? And like I get an emotion, if I see Milana crying in grief, I know that I'm feeling like I'm responsible and all these kind of things without beating myself up over it. And I actually hug her and encourage her to cry. Is that different? Yes, but it's a little hypo hypocritical. Yeah. Because what you're doing is you're encouraging her to feel an emotion that you're denying in yourself. Can you see? So it would actually be more authentic for you to connect to what, where, where am I not connecting to my grief? Do you see the difference? In that instance, I started crying as well and started connecting to some of my grief, but still felt like instead of just leaving her feeling alone in that instance, just to make her not feel better, but to know that I'm with her. Well, actually, if you start feeling your grief in that moment, she will never feel alone, yeah. actually. Um, it's, a, it's a bit like that. If you, you find if you're crying and then somebody else connects to your grief somehow and then they start crying, do you feel more alone or less alone? No. Don't you normally feel less alone under that circumstance? And it's the same with our children, you see. And so so my, my suggestion is, sure, hug them and encourage them to cry, but if I'm not crying and I know <laughs> through this <laughs> principle that I'm denying an emotion they are now feeling... I'm being a bit hypocritical, encouraging them to cry when I myself am not crying. And I know I'm denying the sadness because she's crying. And, and it might be someone else in the room who's denying the sadness maybe. Um, but whoever that is also needs to feel about it. The key is that every single person around the child does have an effect on the child. So, so if grandparents come over for lunch, all right, now we've got a dynamic where there's two generations of parents <laughs> connected to this child... Right, And so now there's two generations of parents who need to apply this principle. Because whatever is going to happen now with the child is going to be reflected not just of the parents, but also of the parents' relationship with the grandparents. Yeah? So we need to be very self-reflective with our children if we really want to you know, work our way through the emotions with them. My, my feelings are, don't encourage your child to do something that you personally do not do First, look at why you do not do it. Because to encourage somebody to do what you don't do is hypocritical, isn't it? Like, don't you feel that? It's, it's hypocritical. If somebody come along, if your dad come up to you, <sighs> having a fag, and he says, don't smoke, son, does that have any effect on you? Of course not. <laughs> you, of course you're going to probably pick up a fag at some point, right? And have a smoke. And it's, not, it, it's natural. To, to forget about what dad's saying and to do what dad's doing. It's a natural thing. And so if what I'm doing is denying my sadness, at the same time I'm saying to my male child, cry away, how hypocritical is that? Like, I need to demonstrate to my child that I have the courage to feel my own sadness. And when I do that, the child ironically will not need to be encouraged to cry away because it, it will already have the courage to deal with its own sadness. Does that make sense to you? Yep. If we have a mic down. Oh, this is a related topic. My grandchild has um, Asperger's. Yep. And she says what she feels straight out. Yeah, it's wonderful, eh? Well, the society doesn't think so. Oh, I think it's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so is, is Asperger's actually a, a designated condition that needs to be treated? I will describe it to you as to what's going on. Because there, there's Asperger's and then there's um, autism. No, and, she's, and, she's definitely on, on the border of Asperger's. She's holding down a job yep. and living by herself. Yep. But she, if she thinks something's funny, she laughs. Of course. <laughs> Yeah, but we don't do that in polite society. What? <laughs> well, I mean, how is that polite? Well, that's how she feels received, and then she thinks, "Ooh." Of I'm course, she feels that because yeah. it, because the so-called polite society is not so polite, yeah. and instead of owning their own emotions, they projected her. You're a silly idiot for for laughing, and she feels that projected emotion, and then feels like she has to shut it down. Now, that's pretty unloving behaviour towards her, but yes. understand that that's the emotion going to every child. Mm. It's just the child who's Asperger's has more of a feeling of it 
and allows the feeling of it more. And then a child who's autistic has no idea of their own emotion in comparison to another's. Mm -hmm. And so they just constantly reflecting the environment's emotion. Mm -hmm. Whereas a child who has Asperger's is more along the lines of feeling their own emotion and, and, then, and then having to worry about how that affects its environment. Mm -hmm. my, my feelings are we need to allow our children to feel their emotions. I'm not saying we need to allow them to run amok because there's a whole True. series of stuff yeah. we need to talk about yeah. with children. But we do need to understand that with children, particularly with Asperger's children, for example, they, they have this beautiful way of expressing their emotion as it truly is. Well, she's a loving person. Exactly. And the reason why she's loving is because... One reason why she's loving is because she expresses her emotion as they truly are. Mm. And what we need to do, rather than condemning such a child, is to actually see that this is what we need to do. Mm. If, if we did this, if we laughed when everything was funny, right, and didn't worry about what everybody else thought about us laughing, and if we cried when everything was sad and we didn't care about everybody else and that what they thought about us crying, gee, already we would have half the suicides or less than half the suicides mm. on, on, that we have on the planet. Mm. You know, with all this shut down emotion, shut down emotion, eventually people rebel against that in some way. And the beauty of an Asperger's child is that they're demonstrating to us what we personally really need to do, to learn to do in our own life. Mm. So on the divine love path, you know, the path towards God's love, once we become at one with God, you also, for the first time, become a child again. Now, many of us are so freaked out about that idea that we don't want to become the child. We, we want to stay an adult. But a child is playful, spontaneous, automatically feels everything it feels. It's automatically connected to love as a result of that. It automatically knows when it hurts and when it doesn't. All of these things are all going to be true for us once we're at one with God again. Once we feel this at one with God, that's what we will have. And, and in fact, children like people who children with Asperger's are demonstrating to us how we will in fact be at some point. We will actually be that kind of person. Now, you can see how much it confronts everyone else's emotion too, oh, can't you? Oh, terribly. You, like, she laughs and everyone goes, hmm, you know, yeah. like... It's, it's treatment that they recommend, you know, she should be treated with this. <laughs> yeah, as her grandmother, I'm sort of saying, no, yeah, she's no, fine. Yeah, the parents should, you know, I mean, the people who say that should be treated for their denial of their emotion. Mm. Yeah. And when they're treated for their denial of the emotion, fortunately, all children will be happy. And not only that, they'll be far less unruly as well in the process, right? It's only the suppression of this emotion that causes so much trouble on the planet, and particularly for our children. Like, our children feel the pain of our suppression more so than any other person. And so it's interesting when you talk to an Asperger's child, like, what they're actually feeling from other people mm. is very accurate. So if you, if you ever have a chance to sit down and talk to a child who had, or an adult who has Asperger's, you'll often find very accurately what emotions in the environment everyone is denying. Wow. Yeah. And I feel if uh, people did that, rather than trying to treat them, um, they'd have a very fast way of curing any, any, any unruly or you know, strange behaviour in an Asperger's child. Because all it is is the parents denied emotion reflected the child and then the child acting it out. No, she's always been a, a really sweet child and yeah. very loving and hurts, gets hurt very easily. Yes, very sensitive mm. to the emotions coming from others. Mm. And that's a good thing, you see. We, we think that's a bad thing. We think, we think that that's a bad thing because, you know, they hurt and they have a cry. But no, that's a good thing. What, what we should be doing is instead of trying to cure her from that, you cure her from feeling the emotions of others, how about we cure our unloving emotions projected at her? Wouldn't that be a better Absolutely. option? Absolutely. Better solution? And my suggestion is that's what we need to do. We need to cure the unloving emotions projected at the child rather than try to cure the child for their response to the unloving emotion. Mm. Yeah. Their response is just an effect of a different cause, and the problem with us on this planet is we keep trying to stop things through effects. We, we make rule after rule, law after law, after law, law, 
to stop the effect of something and we don't want to address the cause. We'll, we'll go, no, no, the cause is too hard. It's all too hard. So what we do is we tune out of the cause. We don't want to know what the cause is because most of the time the cause is our own denied emotions, as I was saying, and we don't want to address that. So, so what we do instead is we make a rule or a law to address the effect. So, you know, most of us feel like doing 130 k's on the highway, don't we? Uh, unless we're quite frightened as a driver, most of us do feel like doing 130 k's on the highway. If you've got a car that does 130 k's and it's nice and comfortable and it's very stable, it feels like 130 k's is the right speed for me, right? Or 140 k's. Yeah, like like one time I had a car and for me it was 180 k's. Like, <laughs> and <laughs> safe car and whatever. So, so, so we often feel that. But then because we worry, you know, we're concerned now about how that affects other people, so instead of me feeling other people, so I'm there on a road and as far as you can see in every direction, there's nobody. And I've still got to do 100 k's. I could be driving in the middle of the road, <laughs> doing as fast as I want like they do in Northern Territory, couldn't I? All right. But as soon as I see a car coming, now if I loved, what would I do? I would automatically slow down and I'd automatically pull over to my side of the road and I'd automatically pass them in such a speed that it's under control and, and that is not going to injure anybody if there's some kind of thing happen or they wander into the middle of the road somehow. You know, I'd automatically be sensitive to all those things, wouldn't I, if I loved? And then when they went past and they cleared off, there's no more cars in. If I loved... And I'm only harming myself, I would... Uh, now, hang on a sec. Yeah. Hang on a sec. <laughs> what does you say? Yeah. Is harming myself loving? No. no. So I would not do like 250Ks on a very unsafe road. But if I was on the autobahn in, in Germany, where there's nobody on the road and there's like, just these wide roads available, that I can just do that and do that with ease without being and be quite safe doing it, then I might do that. I say I might because of course there would also be the love of your own life involved, wouldn't there? How much you love your own life and enjoy your own life would be involved in the decision. But can you see if I love, I will automatically adjust to what is safe and loving to others. Automatically. I won't need to be told, there won't, it wouldn't need to be a law. So, so let's say I'm going past a school and I know children have this spatial awareness thing where they're not spatially aware of what their environment is, don't I? Most of us know that. Most of us were a ch child at some time and we realised that we, we had that issue ourselves. So, so we're not spatially aware as a child. So I'm driving along as an adult and as a school, you know, 25k sign or not, I'm going to slow right down, all right, if I love. Because I know, yeah, this is time the kids are starting to come out of the school. You know, one of these kids might run across the road, you know, it'd be terrible to run into them and, and so forth. So I automatically would adjust my speed and I won't need a, somebody to tell me if I love to slow down. Do you see? But, but it all requires me to love. That's the thing. And so this is where, you know, most of us are in the injured self where we're not really that loving at times, or we're in the facade self where we're hardly connected to anything at all. And so I am now in my emotion of, I want what I want now. You know? So do I notice a school? <laughs> no, not in that emotion I'm not going to notice a school. I'm just going to notice that I'm 15 minutes late for my appointment. Can you see? And you put up a sign that says, 15 kilometres an hour, it's going to have no effect on me hardly, unless behind the sign there's a man with a radar gun going like this. <laughs> now that sign will have an effect on me. You see? You see, we're always dealing with the effects. And until we address the cause, which is always our unlovingness in some way, then we will never change the way society works. The beauty of love is that it removes all law. You don't need a law if you love. Because everything you do is automatically loving. So you don't need a law to stop you from doing unloving things because you automatically want to love. Does that make sense? Like, so, so I won't need a law to stop me from uh, stealing money from you. I won't need a law to stop me. 
because I automatically don't want to steal money from you. Right? And in fact, I don't even want to take money from you when I know you're giving it to me because you want something from me. Right? I wouldn't even want that if I really loved you. And if I really loved you with regard to money, if you were giving money for the purpose of doing something damaging to somebody else, like giving money to a cause like to help somebody have a war or help somebody you know, do something that's quite unloving, I would definitely have some feelings about that, wouldn't I? And I'd definitely not involve myself in that. Can you see? Like, the law of love would prevent me from taking any other action. And in the end, that's what we want. We want the law of love to actually guide our entire life. And when we do that, we don't need another law. But unfortunately, we're addicted to having people tell us what to do. Do you know why? It's because we don't want to take responsibility for what we do. We want other people to tell us and then I don't have to do it myself. I don't have to make the choice myself. You know, in a normal course of a day, I get asked many, many questions. What do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And what do you think about this? And so forth. And my, generally, my standard response is, what do you think about it? <laughs> do you think it's loving or not? What do you think? The main reason why I give that response is because if... If the person's asking me what they should do, there's an, usually an automatic desire in them to make me responsible for what they choose. And why would they want to do that? It's because they don't want to take responsibility for their own life and what they choose. So, so like, for example, just a few weeks ago, I was interviewed by Channel 7 and they'd travelled around the world interviewing a heap of people that I don't even know who are angry with me. Oh, sorry, it was, yeah, it was Channel 7. And they were asking me, what about this person? What about that person? Why is he angry? No, he, he says that your, his wife left him because of you. And I said, I don't even know his wife <laughs> or him. So how could his wife have left him because of me? Oh, it was because of something that you said, you know, in a DVD. I said, so you're telling me that a person will leave their husband because of something I said in a DVD. I obviously didn't say it about their life because I don't know them. And does that sound to you to be like a sane action? Or does that sound to you to be like the reason why she left her husband? Would you leave your husband if I said something generally about something on a presentation, would you? Like, I wouldn't do it if you said something. <laughs> if you said to me, oh, somebody who treats you unlovingly does this, and what would you do if, you, if they were unloving to you? Would you consider leaving them? And if, and if I heard you say all that, I'd go, Mary does that all the time. Oh, I should leave her then. Do you think I'd do that? Of course I wouldn't. Because the only time I would do that is if I don't want to take responsibility for my life or I have other reasons for leaving the person and I just want to use that reason as an excuse so I don't have to tell them the real reasons. The real reason might be, oh, I just had an affair last week with a guy I really liked and, or a girl I really liked, whoever, depending on what it, And if that was the real reason, tell him the real reason. But see, a lot of us don't want to take responsibility for our life and so what we do is we blame somebody else. A lot of times, somebody we don't even know. Just they seem to be in the right place at the right time to be blamed, right? And many of us have that emotion in us of not wanting to take responsibility for our life. That's why, you know, when we, when we have no work, we want to have unemployment. And we want to have unemployment mostly because we want somebody else to be responsible for the fact that we've got no work. And, and we don't see it as a, an attraction event for our soul. Do you see? We don't see it like that. We don't see... We say, oh no, it's the economy. And, you know, we blame external factors, don't we, on a lot of things. And while those external factors might be true, it still doesn't... There are other people who still have work in that economy, so why don't I? There must be something to do with my soul attraction. And unless I understand the truth about my soul, and that is my soul is constantly creating, unless I understand that truth, I will have a lot of difficulty 
ever getting out of these two selves and into my real self. Yeah. So hopefully that's given us a bit of background about children and dealing with our emotions. How are you feeling? Time to stop? No. <laughs> so it isn't. <clears throat> what else would you like to ask? Uh, just wait for Igor to say that. Now it's on. It's on now. It's on. Right. I was wondering if you could let us know whether our spirit guides are in natural love or divine love. Why do I have to let you know whether your guides is in natural love or divine love? I'd like to know whether our spirit guides <sighs> okay. are in So you want me to natural... tell you how to find out? Yes, please. Yeah. Well, the first thing you do is talk to them and then you listen to them. But you see, the issue still is, isn't it, that many of them on the natural love path think they're on the divine love path. So then it starts going, becoming a bit difficult. You see, here's me and my guides. You understand the purpose of your guides and your guardian? Do you understand <coughs> spiritually? Your guardian, let's call one of them the guardian, and sometimes it's the same person. Your guardian is a person who basically is there to protect your life, to help you live as long as possible as long as you possibly can on the earth, basically. Many of you don't want to live as long as you possibly can on the earth, and so they have a lot of difficulty helping you live as long as you possibly can. And many of us are quite reckless with our life, and so our guardians go, no, 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 you know, they're trying to tell us things, but often we're not listening, all right? So that's our guardian's role. Now, our guide is a different role. Our guide's role is to help us develop spiritually and morally. Now, if I have no desire to develop spiritually or morally, there's a high likelihood I don't have a guide. Because <laughs> your guide will only come to you when you desire to develop spiritually and morally. Does that make sense? Now, what kind of guide shall I attract? Well, I'll attract the guide who wants to help me in the way I want to be helped. So, if I want to be helped to deny all emotion, and I want to be helped to live in my mind and I want to intellectually philosophise for the rest of my life, what guide do you think I'm going to attract? Well, I'm going to attract an intellectual philosopher who will help me exactly in the area in which I desire to go. That's what I'll attract. Yep. So this guide would be, you know, if it, if it, if it was mostly a male, then it might be a male I attract. If I am a male who is more open to women than I am to men, then it might be a female guide I attract in that path. But she or he, whoever that guide is, will be assigned to me through this process of my desire. But it's not my intellectual feeling. There's no such thing probably. My intellectual thought, but rather my passionate desire that drives the attraction of the guide. Does that make sense? So if I desire to be on the divine love path and I desire to progress towards God first and I desire to connect to my soulmate and I truly desire to feel all of my emotions and I truly desire to experience truth in that way, then I will automatically have a guide assigned to me. Right? God always gives you what you want. But it's not what you think you want. It's what you really want that you're given. Right? So if in my heart I talk about the path, you know, I talk about you know, discovering divine truth and I talk about love and I talk about... But actually in my heart what I want to do is I would like to intellectually deny all of my negative emotions. What kind of guide am I going to attract? Well, I'm going to attract a guide that helps me intellectually deny all of my emotions. That's the kind of guide I'm going to attract. Because that's what I want. Here, not here. So to actually have a guide who is, understands the divine truth, who is with me guiding me, I need to actually have a longing and a desire for such a guide and have a pure intention inside of myself to actually follow the principles that that guide is going to be able to share with me. 
If I don't, then I am all, already going to attract a different kind of a guide. A guide who helps me deny, perhaps, my emotions and, and that experience. Now, if I'm a Catholic and I desire to become really strong in the Catholic faith, what guide will I attract? I will attract a guide who has developed more in love than I have, but is still in the Catholic faith in the spirit world. That's the kind of guide I will attract. If I desire to know everything about um, the, the American Indians, and I'm fascinated by the American Indians, and I want to grow in understanding the American Indian culture and all those kind of things, what kind of guide do you think I'm going to attract? I'm going to attract an American Indian guide, if there's one available, who will help me to progress on my path. If I'm an Indian in India and I am following a guru on earth who, pro who promotes himself as God and who has all of these intellectual philosophies that he's got associated with the path that he's got, what kind of guide am I going to attract if I desire to follow that same path? Well, I'm going to follow the spirits in the spirit world who this guy is following. Exactly the same way. If I'm a Buddhist on the planet and I love the Buddhist way, I love the aspects of love and caring and all those kind of things, but in addition, I have these uh, feelings of denying emotion, denying desire, wanting to shut down desire and emotion uh, because I feel that's my way to bliss. Um, who am I going to attract? I'm going to attract a guide in the spirit world who has practiced that most of his life. Can you see the relationship? But it, but it depends on my desire as to who I will attract, really attract. Yep. On top of that, we have whole groups of other spirits around us. And these groups of spirits are not that interested in our progression or in our personal safety, in fact. All they are interested in is getting their unhealed emotion, their addiction, met by you. So they project emotion at you and hopefully, if you're compliant, they receive things from you. Or they project that you should go and take a certain action, which is unloving most of the time, and then you go and do it and they get to share in the action that you take. Now these spirits, men and women, are going to be damaging to your own progression, but also they're going to make the life of these two people <laughs> difficult because your guardian is going to struggle to protect you and your guide is going to struggle to guide you because of the influence of these other spirits. Can you see? So if I've got a spirit with me who's a male who's constantly angry with women and every time a woman treats me badly he feels like I should be in a rage with her and I also have an emotion where I feel badly treated by women inside of myself that I don't want to feel then the instant that a woman treats me badly I'm going to fly into a rage with her. I might even beat her. And it might be my definition of bad which might be just like yeah, she talked to a friend and all of a sudden I feel like I'm not loved and I'm not cherished and all those things and all of a sudden I'm influenced by those spirits. You follow me? So these spirits I would classify as the spirits who want to be parasitic. All right. I'm sorry guys, but that's how you're being. And there's not very many happy spirits with me saying that. Um, they are being parasitic because what they are doing is they are sucking and changing what your desires would normally be into something else. And they are, they are doing that by manipulating your unhealed emotional condition. Right? And there's literally millions, billions of them in fact, hanging around the earth trying to attempt to do this. Now in the first century when it says I removed a spirit from such and such or I healed a spirit from such and such, you know, the Bible makes references to these things. And what I was doing was helping the person 
to disconnect from the spirits by helping them and assisting them firstly with their emotional reasons inside of themselves as to why, but also talking to the spirits and helping them see what they're doing to the person. Now many times these spirits are actually family members from the past. And many of the family members from the past actually have diseases in them or they died from a disease like cancer, for example. And many of them will attach to a person, often a child, and, and can even influence the child into having exactly the same disease. So I have actually seen a grandparent die of cancer, connect to a, uh, their grandchild while on earth, and within five years the grandchild dies from leukaemia. Right? I have also seen a man in the spirit world who connected to each generation of men, because they all had the same emotional injury, which allowed it, and he sucked all of the energy out of their pancreas. And they, every single one of them had sugar diabetes and died from sugar diabetes. And as soon as one died, he went to the next, the son of that one, and connected to them. And then he died. And then they went to the son of that one, connected to him, and he died. And then one woman who noticed it happening, she, she, she evicted the spirit out of her own husband and the spirit in his rage connected to the wife and the instant that he was cured of diabetes his wife got diabetes and when I met her she was dying from it you can see the parasitic spirits and what they do with body and everything now what we want to do everything is emotional of course so I mean, when I say everything's emotional everything's based on the condition of our soul of which, of course, there are large amounts of emotions that are unhealed. If we focus on healing these things, when we're automatically provided with protections against any parasitic person, whether they are alive on earth or in the spirit world, and as a result of that, we now can listen to our guide and guardian, and if we continue to grow, what will happen is we'll grow in one or two ways. We'll generally grow either in a very intellectually dominant natural love way, and our guide will be a natural love spirit who, ha who usually has the same background or similar desires to ourselves. Or if we find the divine truth exciting for our soul and we decide to follow it, then our guide will be replaced with a guide who is actually on the divine truth pathway, if you like, of, of connecting to God. But as we grow, the guides will actually change. Because sometimes the guides are just there to help us through a certain emotional state. And once they when you get beyond that state, then they're not the best person to help us beyond that. So they'll often change and somebody else will come along. Does that make sense? Based on our desire to help us through the next stage and so forth. So we'll have our guides changing at times as well as a result of that. Does that make sense? Has that answered yes. your question? Thank, thank you, AJ. Yeah, no worries. Can we come down? Uh, yeah, oh, you've partly answered uh, my question uh, regarding the guides. Um, I've just learned that you're a big fan. Uh, this is a question uh, regarding Elvis. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I've been a fan for about 40 years. Have you? Yep. Yeah. And uh, uh, at night now I see a lot of vision of him. Yes. And so I'm just wondering how he's going. He's going very <laughs> where, well. Where is he, how high yeah. is he, etc.? I met him, uh, I met him, I think it was four years ago now. Yeah. And uh, he came uh, to a gathering we had um, investigating something. At that point, he was in the second sphere. He was on, he understood the divine love path to a degree. He had quite a lot of problems in his body. And because he had quite a nice looking body when he was on earth, he wasn't happy with his body. And so he came to talk to me about, you know, what was going on with his body. And we talked quite a lot about the different things that were going on. And then um, the next time I talked to him was a, about a year and a half later or so. And, and by then he was in the seventh uh, sphere um, and very happy. He, he, by the way, when he passed and for the next, up until we talked the first time, he had not sung in the spirit world at all. Uh, he was quite ashamed of himself and he, and he had no, he didn't sing at all. Um, and he started singing then. And now he holds 
big concerts up there, right? <laughs> yeah, like, as he used to do, but a bit different, and he doesn't move his hips quite the same way. Uh, but you know, it's uh, yeah, he has he has a lovely voice as as he had far better than he had on earth. But even when he was on earth, he had a pretty good voice, right? And um, so he he's now at one with God and doing quite well, hey. And um, he's uh, attempting to help some other people who have been influenced by fame on the earth. He found it very, very difficult when he passed. We talked about that and he said that um, when he first passed, he was receiving so much um, energy from people on earth that eventually he became self-disgusted with it and he actually changed his name. And he called himself John. <laughs> I asked why John. He said, because it's the most popular name on earth. And when anybody thinks of John, it meant that not much energy went to him. <laughs> right? So, um, so he called himself that. And actually, he introduced me as, as that, to me as that. And then owned up to the fact that he was Elvis afterwards. Um, yeah, so he's doing really well now. Excellent. Yeah. And uh, he's often with different people on the, you know, who are discovering divine truth now. Um, yeah, I love his music and uh, uh, particularly his gospel stuff is really quite powerful at times. And a lot of his stuff was quite emotional actually, but none of that really made it to the mainstream. And it was only his mainstream rock that sort of made it popular. As, as with the movies too, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's only those mainstream sort of movies that made it. Whereas he did do a number, a number of movies that were a lot more emotional, um, which not many people have watched. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. What'd you ask? Uh, I've got a feeling. Use the, use the mic. Oh, sorry, I've got a feeling of him around me. Yep. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. He's and around quite a lot on the uh, many people. And then when you were talking about the guides and that, I sort of felt that even stronger. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. He could be your guy. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank I'll you. Talk to him at one point. Find out. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Joy. Yeah. That was the person with the most desire, by the way. Oh, who me? <laughs> Joy was the person with the most desire um, in that moment. You see, it's like. Um, we don't realise, but oftentimes we put up a hand, but there's more of a projection of demand than desire. Does that make sense? And in, in Joyce's case, she's just... <laughs> but she didn't think about her own... Like, what she looked like to doing that at all. And, and it's lovely, isn't it, Joy? And no, 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 it's all right. And that's the reason why I asked her. Go on, far away. Tony, a quick question. Sure. At, at what age do um, children have a guide? And that very much depends upon the desire of the parent and the child together. Um, you see, there's some, there's some really interesting facts to know about children, actually, and how they're guided. Um, guardians, of course, are generally assigned at the moment of conception. Um, that's when a guardian is generally assigned. But a guide is a bit different because a guide is generally assigned when the person, the individual themselves, exercises a desire to actually grow spiritually or morally. Now, for many children on earth now, that doesn't happen until sort of in their, in their sort of after five or six years of age. Um, and many times doesn't happen at all for quite some time until they're in their 30s or 40s. Um, but... It's interesting what happens with the parent's prayer. When the parent has a strong desire in herself or himself to have the child guided by spirits who are protective but also spirits who want to guide the person morally and spiritually, then, then God does assign a child a guide based on the parent's prayer. Does that make sense? So, so what happens, um, and by the way, the guides assigned are usually under those conditions very high guides, actually. They are actually usually at one with God or more advanced than that and uh, are also usually at the same time act as their guardians as well. And it's the desire of the father or mother's prayer that actually creates the corresponding action on God's behalf towards the child 
And by the way, God assigns all guides. In that the guide is driven to come to you based on motivations that they feel they receive from God to come to you. And so every guide, no matter whether it's a guide on the natural love path or on a divine love path, is actually still motivated to be the best person to help you with your current desires. Does that make sense? Mm. And can grandparents influence that at all with prayer? Of course. Any person. Pr prayer is a very powerful tool. And, and in fact, a very powerful, in the end, prayer is the desire. But it has to be a real desire, not a need to protect or a fear or any of those things. It has to be a desire. Does that make sense? It can't be something driven by a fear of wanting them to be looked after. Why would you pray, for example, for your own grandchild to be protected more so than any other child? Can you see already that there has to be some sort of fear associated with that act? Yeah. So that's something to look at. If we go right at the no, I need the microphone, so because we need to hear your question. I feel quite guilty about desire um, to know about the unconscious or dreams and the spirit world. In terms of what happens with that, desires? Um, yeah, no, no, but I, I was saying that I really would like to know your uh, thoughts about the spirit world and the unconscious. Okay. Thank um, you. <laughs> when we go unconscious, all we are is conscious in another dimension. So if you could just imagine now, for most of us we go unconscious when we go to sleep. Um, but uh, there might other, be other things that cause us to be unconscious. For example, some kind of injury or some other kind of thing that occurs which causes us to go unconscious. So, so let me talk specifically about a few different things with regard to being unconscious. One of the first things of unconsciousness, that the most popular one of course is sleep, where we're not conscious of what's going on with our physical body. So here's our physical body just laying down. There's my arms and there's my legs. All right. All right. Laying down. <laughs> Sorry about the stick figures guys. So laying down on a bed or whatever. And we go out to it. Now as we go out to it, what happens is our spirit body, which looks almost identical to our physical form, rises out of our body. And of course our soul is connected to the spirit body first and then it's connected to this physical body. And what happens is there is a cord of energy that maintains a connection between the two bodies. Right? So as, the, as it rises, now it has the flexibility in that unconscious state. Now we are conscious in this state, by the way, the spirit state. We don't remember it most of the time because most of us deny this actually occurs, although many of you do remember it uh, and have experiences of remembering it many times every night. But what happens is that we leave the physical body resting and the cord maintains the energy connection between the two bodies. You follow me? And as the cord maintains the energy connection between the two bodies, the body leaves, and now the body is able to go anywhere it desires, dependent upon its own condition. Do you follow? Yep. Do you want to ask a question? Oh, it has to be a mic, though. Just, yeah, that's it. Are you talking about astral travel? Well, that, that's what we call astral travel. But it actually happens to every single person, every single night they go to sleep. Every single one of you, this happens to every single time you go to sleep. You, are, you actually astral travel. But you're not conscious of doing so in many cases because your physical body has now closed down completely in terms of it's gone into a rest state. And your spirit body, the things that you see in that state, you often don't want to see. And so you don't want to recall them. All right? And where we go depends upon the soul's, remember, the soul's condition. 
So if the soul, the condition of this person's soul, is such that it only allows them to traverse the first dimension of the spirit world, then that's where they'll go. They'll traverse the first dimension of the spirit world. Now in the first dimension of the spirit world, it ranges, at the top of it, is very, very lovely, what, better than the first, better than the best place you can imagine on earth. And the bottom of it is the depth of the hills, which is far worse than any of you can probably imagine. Right? And so some people, because of the different conditions of their soul, the different fears that they have and so forth, start attracting very negative attention from spirits who are already in the spirit world. You follow me? Because we're now in the spirit world in our every night. And so some become very afraid of even going to sleep because of that. So what do you think insomnia is? Insomnia is the fear of actually going to sleep. So there are others who enjoy their sleep so much that they'd rather be there than here. <laughs> right? So they spend half their life or more sleeping because that's what they'd prefer to do, to get away from their life here generally. But every single night, yes, this so-called astral travel happens and you, go, um, and you can go anywhere over the earth you desire as well as anywhere in the spirit world that your soul condition, in other words, your condition in love, allows you to go. Now, because of that, you can often meet up with other people whom you've never met on earth. Many of you have done this and when I talk about it fully, you'll go, oh, is that what happened? What happens is you tee up a meeting with a person in the spirit world because you like them so much, you, you meet them in the spirit world for the very first time and you like them so much, you try to tee up a meeting with them on earth. And then when you meet them, you go, gee, I feel I know you. Because you do know them. That's why you feel like you know them, because you do know them. Right? You've met them before in your sleep state in the spirit world. Also, any parent who has lost a child through to something like, uh, um, what do you call it? Well, yeah, any, but even miscarriage, even a miscarriage, um, will actually be able to spend some time with their child in the sleep state. So many children get to spend time with you, children who have passed get to spend time with you in that sleep state. So, so and you might be asleep seven or eight hours, and for, so for seven or eight hours, many parents that have lost their children are actually spending time with their children in the spirit world in that moment. Right? And when they come back to their body, because of their own emotional pain about the loss of the child, they often will not remember the experience. Because they don't want to feel their grief about the loss of the child. They turn that off and therefore turn off the memory of the joy they just had spending time with their child in the spirit world. Does that make sense? I've seen lots of questions about the spirit world. Lots of questions about the spirit world all the time. Let me finish though. So can you see how we raise out of the body, we then can travel around anywhere that our soul desires as long as the condition of the soul allows the soul to travel in those locations. Now for many people that can be quite a scary experience because of the different unhealed emotions we have of fears in particular. Fear attracts quite tormenting people into our lives and in the spirit world it's the same. So we can often attract people in the spirit world who are quite, look quite terrible and quite scary and we don't want to remember them. And so for many of us we don't remember our sleep state experience at all. Then we have moments of absolute memory of our sleep state. Most people on earth have had memories of their sleep state experiences. And, but, but it's not a very regular occurrence. Most of the time because we don't want to remember the other bits. And so we shut them down. But the truth is that almost everybody I've ever met has had some memory of a sleep state experience at some time. Most of the time it happened in their childhood that they can remember. But still as adults it happens to many of you right now. And this sleep state experience will continue until the body of the person begins to wake up for some reason. Now, it might be through an external influence. So, in other words, the sound 
that the body hears gets passed through the cord to the spirit, uh, to the sp person in the spirit state, and they feel an automatic attraction back to the body. Or the, the body may have an internal function, such as bladder is full, right? And so automatically we come back to our body and go off to the toilet, relieve ourselves, go back, lay down, bang, we're back up into that state again. Um, we also may have external factors, like we may sleep with a partner and they might roll over and snore. Uh, you know, that disturbs us and so that brings us back to our body. We can also have uh, scary experiences as well uh, happening to the body, you know, where somebody, you know, you see somebody in the house, something like that, and all of a sudden you feel like you've got to go back to your body. You can sense danger in the spirit state. Also, things can ha happen in the body in the, when it's laying down that cause us to... Uh, to want to protect our body. So sometimes when we leave our body, some spirits come around our body and we get quite frightened about those spirits that are around our body. And so what we do is we come back to our body to protect our body from, from somehow being harmed by a spirit. Of course, that couldn't happen if our soul was in the right condition without fear. But all of these things happen and that's what brings us back out of our, our slumber and back from the spirit existence. Now, the truth is that this happens to everybody, but very few people remember in an active way. And the main reason why we don't remember in an active way is because of the emotions we have of contrast. So, for example, if I have a deep belief that there is no such thing as a spirit world, and when you're dead, you're dead, you will probably not remember any of these experiences. Because to remember the experience, you've got to confront that belief. And many of us don't want to confront that belief, and so we don't remember the experience. If you have a deep uh, feeling that uh, when you die, um, you're going to be in a terrible place, and some people have that feeling in them quite strongly, then it's highly unlikely you'll remember your spirit experiences, because you won't want to know what place you were in. If uh, We also have many things happen in our sleep state, which are quite unusual, but obvious when you think about it. For example, if there's a husband and wife living together and the wife goes to bed, the husband goes on a trip. But on that trip, he actually cheats on his wife. There's a high likelihood in her sleep state that the wife will already know that it's happened because she is already out of body and can watch what he's doing. Do you understand? This is why many of them have a, this sixth sense. Something's going wrong, something's going wrong. And because we wake up with it, and, and the reason why we wake up with it is because we've actually observed the occurrence. Right? So all of those kind of things can happen too. Many things that we don't want to see can happen. The other thing that can happen is we can often plan meetings with people in our sleep state, where we meet up with people who are actually permanently in the spirit world. And we can actually meet up with them, have chats with them and so forth. Now, many of you, when you first met me, realised that that's probably happened. Have you not? Yeah. Some of you have actually had a, uh, pictures in your mind of it happening, where you've had a talk with me in your sleep state at some point, or you've been at a meeting like this in your sleep state at some point, and that's all happened, of course, too. So there's all these different things that happen in your sleep state. And uh, the sleep state is a beautiful state. It's a gift God has given to every single person, no matter what their condition, to rest from the earth's pressures and actually go to some place that can educate them, so I give them another education. Now, you know what actually happens with all these memories? Your soul has every single one of them in the soul, and your spirit body actually has every single one of the memories in your mind. And what happens with your memory, and this is a major thing to understand about our human memory, our memory needs a trigger point before we will actually find the actual occurrence. So, so if I don't have the trigger point accessible, then I won't remember the event. And this is why it could be a the trigger point, could be a smell, it could be a something we see, it could be something we feel, it could be something we taste. But it also can be an experience in the spirit world that, that we remember that is our trigger point. And once we get the trigger point, we will actually, that will lead us back to a full knowledge of the event. Now, 
my suggestion, if you're fascinated about all of this material, is to, to read some books that I have downloadable on the website, right? They're by Robert James Lees. They're written in 19th century language, so they're written 100 years ago. Um, so they're very poetic in the way they've sort of written, but, but they're very clear about a lot of these experiences. There's three books. There's one called Through the Mist, through, through, not thought, through, through the Mist, Through the Mists. That's the first one to read because there's a series. The next one is The Life Elysian. And the third one is called The Gate of Heaven. They're all downloadable as a PDF on the website. They also can all be ordered on Lulu, if you've ever done any ordering on Lulu, as books that you can read. My suggestion, if you want to know a lot about the spirit world and the interactions between the spirit world and the earth, this is a very, very good book. If I give you a little bit of background to it, Robert James Lees was a man who lived on earth and who from a very, very young age had the ability to talk to spirits. And what happened was over the period of his life he went to church and he went other things but he never lost this ability and when he was in his 20s he started to develop it. He went through a period of just receiving information from all sorts of spirits but then when he was around in his late 20s he started being developed by a group of spirits who would come and sit with him and tell him things. Eventually he saw them, he could see them with his own eyes and eventually they would actually be in a body that he could touch and they'd sit down in his living room while he dictated from them these messages. He could see them and they'd pick up his books and refer to them and all sorts of things while they were sitting next to him. They would just, they would just materialise in his, in his uh, study and give him messages. Now, one spirit in particular who was a man on earth called Frederick he came and gave them, him this series of books that he wrote with Robert James Lees. Now, Robert James Lees describes this entire process. Robert James Lees was also interesting in that he helped the police with the Jack the Ripper case in London as well. There's actually documented evidence of him helping them. So he was an interesting man and the police couldn't solve the case and so they decided to turn to a psychic to try or attempt to solve the case, right? So um, this, these series of books, in my opinion, are one of the best series of books to read about an accurate depiction of the spirit world in different dimensions. There's very few books that actually present an accurate picture of the spirit world in lots of dimensions. They only usually refer to one dimension, the first dimension, or the second dimension at the most. Most of the books that are channeled only refer generally to those two dimensions generally. But these books... This one refers to the dimensions up to the seventh dimension. This one refers to the dimensions up to the seventh. And this one refers to the condition of at one with God. So they're very, very interesting to read. Joy, like, have we got a mic? Because I think you're going to mention about the CDs or something, aren't you? No? It's, um, it's better than that because what Igor has done is put a DVD computer file on these discs right. that include the books. Oh, okay. Okay. So is that right? Is that correct? So those three books are actually <clears throat> on the giveaway DVDs at the back. Yeah. Yep. So all of you have already taken a copy of them. We'll find these three books on that somewhere. I'd personally like to read them on a piece of paper. And if you go to do that, you'll have to go to Lulu. And there's a publisher in the USA, Joseph Babinski, his name is, that I've met. And uh, he has been publishing those and you can actually buy them here in Australia and get them sent within a week or so. So they're, they're very, very good books. Um, my suggestion is to read through them. Now, initially you may find it very hard going, right? Because it refers to a lot of things that you wouldn't be used to hearing about or, you know, because it's very, very different to an average channeling about what's going on in the spirit world. But it's very pragmatic and down-to-earth and direct. And that's what I love about those books. They answer questions very well. Everything's uh, pregnant with, with illustration and life about the spirit world. 
And it's ve they're a very good series of books to read. In those books, he explains a lot of what happens in our sleep state, in that state of unconsciousness. Now, I've talked about the sleep state, the first state of unconsciousness. Let's look at the state of unconsciousness where somebody gets knocked in the head by a cricket ball or something and goes out like a light for a moment. Now, that is a little different in that any time we have a physiological interference in the natural process of our spirit form leaving our, our physical form, our spirit form is often just as affected by the emotion that the, and the feelings of the spirit body as the spirit body is. For that reason, there are times when the spirit body can also be out to it in the exact same way as the physical body is out to it. Right? And for that reason, the spirit body will have just a very short gap in its memory of what actually occurred during that period. Now, this is very different than a person being unconscious for a long period of time due to some kind of long-term illness, such as, you know, like they might have uh, cancer and they're pu pumped full of morphine and often they're going in and out, in and out. Now, morphine and other drugs affect the spirit body as well as the material body. They affect the energy systems of the bodies and so therefore they affect what happens to the memory of the person who is ta taking those drugs. So, so from a doctor's perspective, um, what we'll be looking at is the spirit form will still leave the material form while, while they're asleep but their consciousness is not as clear and will still be befuddled by the drug that's being taken. So therefore it has an effect on their ability to recall accurately what's happened. So for many people what happens when they're in a state where they're going in and out of consciousness and many people in their old age are going in and out of consciousness, it just depends on whether it's a drug-induced consciousness or, or unconsciousness such as you know some kind of pain killing drug or so forth or whether it's a natural process as to how much they will remember but for example you can actually sit with the grandparent who may be you know laying on their deathbed as the saying goes and and they're you know often not there you feel but actually you can sit and talk to them and you'll feel a response sometimes in the physical body of the person as if they can hear you. And the truth is there's a high likelihood they can hear you because while they're not too influenced by drugs, they have an ability <coughs> to hear what's being said to them and to feel about what's being said to them. And it's very interesting too because um, people with Alzheimer's, for example, are people <coughs> who do not want to remember their earth-based experience generally very much at all and so eventually they start shutting down portions of the brain that remember all of their earth-based experience. The spirit body's mind of course still remembers and recalls those experiences. So often a person with Alzheimer's has to go out of body um, in order to avoid the experiences and they try to remain in a quite disconnected state. And it's interesting when you talk to doctors who have actually become conversant with spirits in the process, that you can actually see the relationship between what happens to the Alzheimer's patient in terms of their basic day-to-day behaviour and how much spirit influence they're under because they're out of body most of the time. So there's whole sets of discussions we could have about the medical science, if you like, behind this process of going out of body and going to sleep. Yeah. Okay. I think I'm exhausted. Are you? <laughs> um, I would like to thank you so much for coming along to our gathering here today and I hope you enjoyed yourself today. Um, and yesterday, for those of you who come along yesterday. For those of you who haven't received any, there are free DVDs up the back. They come in a pack. There's a pack of 14 DVDs. Please, please feel free to take the entire pack. Uh, it's a pack related to introduction, like Secrets of the Universe or Introduction to Divine Truth. It's about prayer, longing for love, longing for truth, humility and faith. 
that's the main subjects of the DVDs. As you also heard, they contain some PDF documents as well that we've placed on there too for you. Um, so please feel free to take them with you when, when you leave. Myself and Mary are not sure when we're going to be getting back to Albury. Um, a lot depends on desire, you know, we feel the desire of ev everywhere. Where we're going from here is we're going across to Mildura. Uh, we've got this little church that's, uh, uh, that we're speaking at in Mildura, so that'll be interesting. And uh, then we travel from Mildura back down to Melbourne, where we'll have a, a session next Saturday. And then we go from Melbourne back home to Queensland. So that's our travels over the coming week or two. We would love to um, firstly thank Patricia for exercising her desire, because one of the reasons why we're actually here is because of Patricia's incessant desire. So, um, so we'd love to thank you for inviting us to come down. And, uh, and it's been, been lovely to meet you as well. Yep. On behalf of everyone here, we'd like to thank you very much for a fantastic seminar. Yeah, and we are very grateful that you and Mary and your crew have been able to come and speak to us here in Albury. Yeah. I'm sorry we couldn't have put warmer weather for yeah. you. <laughs> but it would need to be Queensland weather. Warm, <laughs> That's, That's right. Not possible. Well, we thank you very much and we'll show that by acclamation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, myself and Mary would also like to thank you for the donations you have given. Uh, that will enable us to print up some more DVDs and, and helps us with our travels around that we want to go and visit other people as well. So we'd like to thank you for that. And um, I hope that you've been able to have a fair few of those questions of yours answered. If you listen to the DVDs now that are on YouTube and also um, the ones that are available in terms of in production... Um, you'll find that lots of questions you might have had over the last two days are probably answered in some form in those DVDs. What we're trying to do, and it's just dependent on resources really and time, but what we're trying to do is actually make an index of um, all of the different subject matters that are covered by all different DVDs <laughs> and then put them on the site so that if you want to know about the soul and parenting... You can choose that and it lists the DVDs that talk about parenting and the soul and questions about that, you know. And we, we, we would like to create a system that uh, is quite seamless in the website that allows you to be presented with that. But that might still be a few months coming because of the different... Uh, the, the amount of effort involved in doing things like that. But uh, at the moment what we do is we now have the recordings. You notice we've had two cameras recording. We have the recordings of the, uh, of the session and what we do now, Igor and his, uh, uh, mostly gets the recording and then he tries to get it onto YouTube as fast as he can. So usually that's a couple of days later where that happens and the beauty of that is that now people all around the world can actually be like they're, being, they're here having, a, having this, this discussion. And we also then uh, get the audio of that uh, discussion and we, try to, we turn that into an MP3 file which we also place on the internet which will only happen once I get the time which is probably going to happen when I get back home. Um, and we upload those audio files onto the internet for free for people to listen to as well. So, and all of those are available on the website that's called www.divinetruth. Dot com. All right. Now, anything to do with the God's Way of Love organisation, which is a non-profit organisation myself and Mary have just started setting up to help people develop spiritually and emotionally and also help them in practicalities on, on, the, on understanding divine truth, um, that is all on the godswayoflove.org um, website. And what we try to do there is all the team meetings that we have with teams and so forth. If you, like if you read up a bit about it, I have yet to do everything for that website. So unfortunately, there's not much detail there at the moment. But uh, eventually, we'll get more detail there. And um, at the moment, though, there are team meetings that are slowly being loaded 
onto that website as well. So that means that you can actually listen to the team discussions that we have, which are more, far more informal, um, where you know, you, there's anywhere from 10 to 30 or 40 people around. Oh, sometimes there's 50 or 60, depending on how large the team is. The uh, mediumship team's getting quite large now, so we can't fit in our house anymore with the mediumship team. Um, but what we do is we try to place that on the internet as soon as we can as well. And that keeps everyone around up to date with all of those things. So hopefully that information will help you on your, in your desire to connect to God and connect to yourself and connect to your mate and, and also to progress in love. So that is our gift to you as well. But we'd like to thank you for your time. We understand that your time is very precious, as we know. It's something that nobody can ever give back to you. So we'd love to thank you for you just investing, ha having a, enough of an open mind and uh, investing your time just, just to come and listen to what we've presented. So we'd like to thank you for that. <laughs> so we'll catch you at another time, but I cannot say when that will be. Because I don't know what your desires are. <laughs> Collectively. <laughs> we'll catch you later, guys. See you.